Senator Shelley Moore Capito is one of the Republicans who met with President Biden earlier this week as a, an attempt to reach a compromise. And we welcome her now back to Bloomberg. Uh, Senator, thank you so much for your time. In that meeting, did you walk away? You've done a lot of deal making up on Capitol Hill and with the White House. Did you walk away with a sense there is a deal there to be done? You know, we had a two-hour meeting with the president in the Oval Office. It was a great exchange of ideas, and we talked about more targeted reform and, and kind of took apart a little bit his $1.9 trillion. He didn't make any promises. He listened intently. He was very well prepared, and he seemed to be interested, in, particularly in the targeting numbers on individual checks in terms of do we really want to be sending checks to families that are making $300,000 a year whose lives really have not changed? And so I think that was the biggest area that he signaled that he might make some uh, make some adjustments, but we, that's yet to be seen. There are some reports on the Bloomberg, actually, about the very point you just made, that if you really look at the upper end before it really phases out, there are some people who are making a fair amount of money and, as you say, maybe didn't lose their jobs. Do you have an approach in your compromise proposal to deal with that, and did the president indicate maybe that made sense? that sort of approach. Well, what we did was we lowered the uh, the income level of which you would be available to get a stimulus check to about 150,000 per couple, and we felt like and the statistics bear out that you're using this as stimulus. This is money we want back into the economy, and at those income levels where people really are hurting, maybe can't pay their rent, buy their food, uh, they are spending their stimulus checks. If you get up into over 200 or 300 thousand dollars, people are saving it or they're, they're not using it to provide that stimulus that we really need to keep this economy moving. And, and also, I think, do we want, really want to be sending taxpayer dollars to people who have had really little or no effect during this pandemic? Uh, I say no. Senator, as you know well, there's more or less a two-track approach right now. One is the possible compromise that would be by regular order. The other is a budget resolution to really go with a simple majority, including uh, Vice President Kamala Harris. Do you have a sense on the latter, that is the budget resolution of ultimately being reconciliation, do you have a sense of what, whether all the Democrats would go along with that? Because to win it, they'd have to get every single last Democrat. Well, I think certainly uh, they are moving in that direction with confidence, and that usually signals that they've already counted their votes and have the votes. Uh, I think we are going to be having a process uh, where we are able to add uh, amendments to the budget resolution, which I think in some cases maybe they might be some uh, some climate amendments, maybe there might be some health care amendments, maybe there might be some targeting amendments uh, to uh, what the issue we were just speaking about. Uh, you know, if we can carve off one, we being the Republicans, carve off one Democrat. You know, we've we've weakened a little bit, I think, their effort as it moves it moves to the House. But at this point, it sounds like if they can get their 50 plus the vice president, they're moving forward. And I think that's um, unfortunate because COVID relief is the one place that we know and have gotten much bipartisan support. Uh, Senator, you have a key Democrat right there coming from the state of West Virginia, Joe Manchin, who's been signaling he has a little reservation about that full $1.9 trillion. Have you spoken with him? Do you have a sense? Seems almost from the outside like if the two of you could get together, you could do a deal. Well, uh, I speak to Senator Manchin all the time. We've known each other for decades and uh, and have a very good relationship. Um, I'll let him speak for himself, but I think his latest statement said that he would accept a $1.9 trillion uh, stimulus package. So I'm not sure exactly where he is. I'll let him speak for himself on that one. We do talk a lot, though. Uh, Senator, give us a sense of the timing. If, in fact, the Democrats went by way of budget reconciliation, how long would it be likely to take? You know, I think that's a great question because this was one of the one of the selling points we thought was most powerful for uh, going in to talk with President Biden. He wants something. He kept uh, stressing urgency and timing, and so we kept saying the quickest way to get here is a bipartisan bill where we have uh, a lot of agreement. And uh, if you're going to go through budget reconciliation, what you're going to see is probably a month to six weeks, and uh, you've lost that time. So I would say month to six weeks if they go through the budget budget reconciliation. Uh, direction, which is what they're signaling they're going to do. We're losing time here. We could have had this in a bipartisan, at least the parts we agree on, we could have had in a bipartisan agreement much, much earlier. Uh, Senator, we talked about President Biden perhaps indicating he would be willing to do more targeting on those individual payments. What about the other way? With your proposal, uh, something over $600 billion, is there room for you to move that up a bit? 
Sure. I mean, I think anytime you go into a negotiating uh, position, and I think uh, that that's what our, our mindset was of the 10 of us in there, we think this uh, takes the best parts of his plan. Uh, the vaccine and texting all matches him. The opioid matches him. The nutrition matches him. We made adjustments, obviously, on state and local and some of the unemployment and, 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 and school monies. So let's, start, let's see where our differences are and talk from there. We've gotten some reply back from the White House, but it's mostly been pushback. Uh, what comes next, if anything, in this exchange between these 10 Republican senators and the White House? Is somebody supposed to call somebody else? Well, we have been. We've been in, we've still got, you know, conversations going with the White House, yes. But I think that what we need to do is is sit back down, certainly probably not with the president, because, you know, he doesn't have uh, two hours to spend every day with us. But I would say uh, he is committed to unity. He spoke a lot in January the 20th in his inauguration about how uh, uh, passionate he is about serving everybody and listening to all the ideas. And he was certainly uh, signaling that in the meeting that we had. But uh, I think... I think uh, congressional leaders have a different way uh, they want to do this and the way they want to push it through. And we kept trying to say, can you take the extraneous things out? Can you take cybersecurity out? What does that really have to do? Can you take minimum wage out? That's not a COVID relief uh, item. And we, did, we, we haven't found any willingness on their part to really remove those items that are very divisive. You mentioned earlier as part of a budget reconciliation, perhaps something having to do with climate being amended. Talk about climate for a second, because President Biden has been fairly aggressive in executive orders so far. And your home state of West Virginia, do you envision a world in which you can redirect your economy into clean energy and actually keep the jobs or even increase the jobs? Well, let's look at what a state like West Virginia has provided and provides for the nation. We have natural resources of coal and natural gas that we've powered this nation for uh, over a century. And, and we have a lot of great, hardworking people. We're looking for stability and we're looking for easier transitions. We did not get that in the Obama administration. The troubling thing to me is it's the same faces in the Biden administration. And that signals to me that they have no interest in taking into consideration the ravage that that uh, the policies wreak on uh, places like West Virginia. But we are transitioning in West Virginia to a more high-tech economy. We're working as hard as we can to work with research and development to keep those energy uh, processes moving. But we cannot just drop certain people off of the ledge like the, like we were dropped off uh, over the last eight years of the Obama administration and think it's okay because joblessness, depression, rise in opioid and drug addiction, it's been really devastating for our state and tough for me to watch as a native West Virginian. Mm -hmm. The Senate has other business it has to attend to with the trial of uh, Pre former President Trump coming up on impeachment charges. Is there any prospect of his being convicted and, and specifically, as I understand it, you were one of the Republican senators who voted to say, actually, it shouldn't even be going forward because he's no longer in office. So those people who voted that way, there's no way you're going to convict him having said you shouldn't be having a trial, right? And doesn't that take care of the two-thirds requirement? You know, I'm certainly going to listen, and I understand that they, they filed their pretrial arguments yesterday. I haven't gotten a chance to read all of that or in depth or anything. Uh, you know, I, I, I am charged as being a juror, and I'm going to listen to what comes through in the impeachment trial. But I do believe, as I voted, that uh, the Constitution says that you would uh, remove and, uh, and prevent the president from running again. Well, we can't remove an impeachment because he's not the president. So that sort of nullifies, in my view, the, the vision that the founders had and making it, uh, uh, I think, a strong constitutional uh, argument that you can't impeach a president who's already out of office. So uh, I think a lot of us felt that way. I think it's going to be difficult to convict, but we haven't heard the evidence yet, and I think I would reserve judgment on that. So, Senator, I want to wrap this up by letting you brag on your state here a little bit, because your vaccination yeah. rates in West Virginia are pretty impressive. What are you doing in West Virginia? What can you teach the rest of us? You know what we're doing in West Virginia is we're utilizing all of our local assets. Uh, the governor has done a great job along with the National Guard, our local pharmacies, our city mayors and counties, uh, our county health departments have been fantastic. The, the federal government laid out a plan for vaccination uh, delivery and, and dispensing. We went away from that and created our own plan because we know each other best. And so we have the best vaccine, vaccine distribution in the country. We're proud of it. We have, I think, a, um, a, a, a way, a, a 
way forward for states to get more shots in the arms quicker, and that's what we're doing in West Virginia. We have a vulnerable population, and it was really important that we get those nursing home and assisted living folks taken care of first. We knew where they all were because we've been testing them. So it's just really been a, a, um, a logistical uh, win for us, and we're really proud of it. What's that going to do for your economy? Because a lot of people are concerned if you can't get them vaccinated, you can't get people back out to restaurants and things like that. Mm -hmm. Well, our schools reopened uh, about two weeks ago, and, uh, and you know, there's been some pushback like we see across the nation, but by and large, they're reopened, and that's big. Our restaurants are reopening, uh, and as we get this vaccine distribution, we get those double shots for the ones that need the two shots. Uh, I think uh, by the time our great tourism uh, season comes along in the spring, we have a great winter one, too, in the spring. Uh, it's going to be great. We have a new national park in West Virginia we were able to get at the end of the year, so we got lots to see. Senator, you've got a lot of things to do. You've been very generous with your time. I'm going to let you go and do you. some other work. Thank you so much. That's Republican Senator from West Virginia, Shelley Moore Capito.